All right. Well, you may be uh, interested to know that uh, Christian Ovrar was uh, the mission president of the area in northeastern Italy where I grew up when I was about 10 years of age. And uh, about 20 years ago, as a young, uh, as a new uh, student, Italian student at Ricks College, I took a Book of Mormon class from Jerry Hansen. So we are an international church, but it's also a small world in the church, especially in Europe. <laughs> um, a historic event for the LDS Church in Italy took place in Rome on July 30th, 2012. Giorgio Napolitano, president of the Republic of Italy, signed legislation which recognized the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, along with two other religious organizations, as a full legal partner of the state. This intesa, or agreement, has both legal and practical significance in that it gives the church every right and benefit available to other similarly recognized religious institutions. You can see a picture of uh, President Napolitano there, who's approaching the age of 90, and also a description of the uh, uh, legal status of the church prior to uh, 2012. Among other things, the Intesa gave the church leaders unhindered access in their pastoral support for members in the military, in hospitals, and in prisons, and guaranteed confidentiality in their communications with members permitted church members a modest tax deduction for charitable donations, provided authorization for LDS seminaries and institutes with the possibility that courses might even be eligible for public school credit, allowed teaching of LDS religion courses in public school if the church decided to do so, it stabilized the visa situation for missionaries and mission presidents and the granting of residency permits, and denied police and military the right to enter and search LDS church buildings without authorization. As one of only 11 non-Catholic churches to have signed an intesa with the Italian government, the church achieved a status that symbolically and psychologically represented a badge of authenticity and legitimacy a public affirmation that the religious community has come of age and attained an equal standing in Italy's public square. It was undoubtedly a historical milestone for Mormonism in Italy, which will be rivaled in significance only by the completion of the Rome Temple, presently expected to be in 2015. While the Intesa process took over 15 years from the day of the application submission to the day in which the law took full effect, the whole history of Mormonism in Italy functions as the necessary background and foundation for this important achievement. It is a history with a large one century gap within a 162 year time frame extending from the day in which the first Mormon missionary set foot on Italian soil to Napolitano's signature of the Intesa. Two phases are clearly recognizable. The first, covering a limited 15 year period between 1850 and 1865, uh, to be precise, the Italian mission uh, officially closed in 1867, but there were no uh, missionaries present in Italy between 1865 and 1867. Um, then there was this one century gap, and uh, during that time, uh, again, to be precise, I should also say that there were um, branches of LDS servicemen uh, organized after the, the Second World War, and the second ranging from 1965 to the present. A comparison of these stages highlights significant differences in context, focus, approach, and objectives to such an extent that any continuity between the 19th century LDS presence in Italy and later 20th and early 21st century Italian Mormonism is not immediately apparent. Yet, such a line of continuity exists and it emerges from a careful analysis of the recent path to the Intesa. Specifically, the connection between 19th century and 21st century Mormonism in Italy is to be found in the interactions, tensions, and interfaith relations between Mormons and Waldensians, which range from conflict to friendship and from competition to cooperation. The Waldensians have their historical origins in Lyon, southern France, in the 12th century, 
when Peter Waldo and his followers distinguished themselves by preaching a form of Christianity that was based, among other things, on strict adherence to the Bible and on voluntary poverty. It did not take long for the group to be declared heretical by Catholic authorities and for Waldo and his Waldensians to have to relocate to the Piedmont valleys of present-day northwestern Italy. Although persecuted in subsequent centuries, including an order of extermination issued against them in 1487, the movement managed to survive due in part to the isolation provided by the Alpine surroundings. Following the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, Waldensian leaders joined the Swiss Reformed tradition of John Calvin and became, to all effects, a Protestant denomination. In 1848, Charles Albert, the ruler of the Kingdom of Piedmont, Sardinia, extended civil rights to the Waldensians, who for the first time in their history were assured liberty of conscience. And now if you look at the map of Italy in 1850, the kingdom of uh, Piedmont Sardinia would be the, the orange salmon colored section. Um, Italy would not become a United Nation until the year in which the American Civil War started, 1861. Only two years later, in 1850, the first Mormon missionaries would set foot in Piedmont and begin their evangelization of what a decade later would officially become Italian soil. Lorenzo Snow, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve and one of the first Mormon missionaries to Italy, explained the decision to begin proselytizing among the Waldensians to be only partially due to the favorable legal setting brought about by Charles Albert. He was fascinated by the history of the Waldensians and in fact thought of them as the rose in the wilderness or the bow in the cloud. When he visited a public library in Liverpool to obtain more information on this people, he read that they were a remnant of the primitive Christian church and that they had been the means of preserving the doctrines of the gospel in their primitive simplicity. He and other church leaders before him saw striking parallels between the persecutions that both Mormons and Waldensians had had to endure and undoubtedly felt that the doctrinal parallels between the two faiths, including a focus on Christian primitivism, a belief in the apostasy and the affirmation of spiritual gifts, would mean that the Waldensians would be well prepared to receive the Mormon message. Consequently, the first phase of missionary work in Italy, which extended from 1850 to 1865, was almost exclusively concentrated in the Waldensian valleys of Piedmont. Notwithstanding numerous obstacles, language barriers, political and social hurdles, difficulties of travel and challenging alpine terrain, isolation, discouragement, and some conflicts internal to the church, the missionaries obtained a degree of success in the near two decades of early Mormon proselytism in Italy. Three branches would be established in the valleys and about 180 Waldensians would convert to Mormonism during the mission's existence, although most joined in the first five years of missionary activities. About half of all converts would emigrate to Utah where they would contribute to the establishment of the church in the West. Uh, names like uh, Cardins, uh, Malins, Buse, Bertux, and others are still nowadays uh, prominent church members that are descendants of these early Waldensians. The remaining members were either excommunicated, returned to the Waldensian church, or are unaccounted for. While a harvest of less than 200 souls with about um, 80 representing permanent conversions may appear meager, it must be remembered that the Waldensian population in the valleys only amounted to about 20,000 individuals, a number that kept decreasing because of immigration. In other words, the Mormon missionary activity was certainly noticed and, as might be expected, encountered stiff opposition. In 1851 in particular, following the conversion of some prominent families, Waldensian ministers began to actively counter LDS missionary activities through anti-Mormon literature, public debates, and denunciations from the pulpits. Rumors and printed materials stated that the missionaries were agents sent to Italy to find polygamous wives for Mormon church leaders in Utah. Mormon meetings were occasionally disturbed and verbal threats exchanged. Pastors used both preaching and practical means to protect their flocks from the Mormon message. They reminded their parishioners about their ancestors' sacrifices for the Waldensian faith in order to dissuade them from accepting a different baptism. 
and when crop failures and economic crisis led many inhabitants to turn to the ministers for assistance, the clergy made help conditional on the person's renunciation of Mormonism. Moreover, since a few hundred Waldensians were already emigrating every year in search of better opportunities, leaders in the valley were particularly wary of the Mormon focus on emigration to America. In the summer of 1854, this concern even reached the Piedmont House of Deputies, where Joseph Milan, himself a Waldensian, wondered whether the Mormons should be driven out immediately. Well, the 1850s conflict between the Mormon missionaries and the Waldensian pastors is undeniable. It never reached proportions where the elders or church members came to fear for their lives. Furthermore, when one looks at the history and size of this persecuted religious minority, Waldensian defensiveness in response to Mormon proselytizing efforts is certainly understandable. Yet, defensiveness did not translate into refusal to extend religious freedom to a competing religious group. LDS missionaries would not have been able to organize three branches and to convert almost 200 individuals had there not been a degree of religious freedom within mostly isolated valleys that were practically monolithic in terms of religious affiliation. In other words, when faced with the opportunity to show whether their protracted advocacy for religious freedom was purely self-interested, or rather based on a deep commitment to a foundational human value, the Waldensi in the valleys of Piedmont, because this kind of freedom of religion in 19th century Italy was more of an anomaly than a standard. This was also expressed by those early missionaries who attempted to expand the work beyond the Waldensian valleys into Catholic Italy. Following the departure of the last Mormon missionary from the valleys of Piedmont in 1865, the LDS Church would not officially return to the land of Italy for a full century. The reasons for this absence are complex and can be traced both to factors that are internal to the LDS Church and to historical events that affected Italy's openness to Mormon proselytism. Among the latter, the Second Vatican Council, which took place between 1962 and 1965, is worthy of a brief mention. This ecumenical council represented an aggiornamento, or updating, of the Catholic Church's approach to the modern world, which had been mostly negative up to that point in time. Vatican II would bring about significant changes in a direction of greater openness. For example, in the Declaration Dignitatis Humanae, the Council affirmed unequivocally that every human being has a foundational right to religious liberty. Interestingly, the Italian zone of the LDS Swiss mission had been open only a few months earlier, with missionaries being sent to seven cities where LDS American servicemen or a handful of Italian members were already residing. This second phase of missionary work in Italy began with great enthusiasm and quick success. 18 months later, in August 1966, following the Italian zone's considerable success, a separate Italian mission was organized, uh, with Florence being uh, it its uh, headquarters. The country was rededicated by El Elder Ezra Taft Benson. In fact, you have a picture of him there during the rededication of Italy uh, in Torre Pellice, the Waldensian Valleys. And by the way, that was more of an afterthought. The original plan was to have the rededication in Florence, but it was the same year of a major uh, flooding. The Arno River overflew, and so it wasn't possible to do it in Florence. Um, so after that rededication, the, the work continued in its steady advance, notwithstanding difficulties in public relations, challenges in, in training native leadership, and other obstacles typical of an emergent church setting. In 1971, a second Italian mission was created with statistics indicating the presence of almost 1,500 members organized into 25 Italian branches and four servicemen's group. Two additional missions were created in the later 70s, bringing the total number to four, later consolidated back to two, and visits by two church prophets, Harold B. Lee and Spencer W. Kimball, galvanized the Italian saints and brought added media exposure to the church. One of the earliest memories I have as a, as a child uh, growing up in the church was the visit by President Kimball when I was probably about six years of age. 
Overall, the 1970s and early 80s were characterized by accelerated rates of conversion to Mormonism as demonstrated by the formation of the first two Italian stakes in Milan, 1981, and Venice, 1985. This golden period of missionary work was followed by three decades of slower growth, but increasing maturity and stability within the church, and greater acceptance and integration in Italian public life. Presently, nine church stakes dot the Italian map, and evidence of the maturation of the local leadership can be found in the calling of many Italians to senior positions in the church hierarchy, seven mission presidents, a Swiss temple president, and numerous regional representatives, area 70s, and stake presidents. Landmark events also played a role in this slow but steady trajectory of growth and public visibility. A highlight of the 90s was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's European tour, which included a visit to Italy in 1998. And President Monson's 2008 announcement of the church's plans to construct a temple in Rome certainly marked a historic moment. More history would be made in 2012 with the achievement of the previously mentioned Intesa and the signing of a contract between the Italian National Archives and Family Search, allowing for the complete digi digitization of the archives' historical records. The next milestone will be the temple's dedication itself. Although cursory and highly simplified, this sketch of Mormonism's progress in Italy highlights a few significant differences between its early and later phases. The 19th century Italian mission lasted less than two decades, whereas the later mission organization, begun about half a century ago, was to be permanent in nature. Similarly, the early organization of three branches within the Waldensian valleys was not as much a step in the establishment of a permanent Mormon presence in Italy as it was a need to provide temporary spiritual shelter for members preparing to emigrate to Zion. Limited resources and the strongly millenarian view of the 19th century church gave such an urgency to the gathering of the elects that the church did not set roots into Italian soil then like it would instead beginning in the 20th century. Another big difference between the early and the later Mormon phases of evangelization was its focus. 19th century efforts were almost exclusively centered around a small Protestant minority in a very limited geographical location, whereas the new Italian missions expanded to reach all corners of the country without concern for people's religious backgrounds or beliefs. In short, there appears to be a significant discontinuity between the two phases of the Mormon presence in Italy, so much so that we feel like we're looking at two very different stories as opposed to a single narrative in two separate acts. Yet, the discontinuity is not as stark as it appears to be at first glance. A significant line of continuity emerges from the interactions that Mormons and Waldensians have had and continue to have in Italy, not as much as at the general membership level, but especially at the level of leadership and public affairs. Although only a handful of Waldensian converts have joined the church in recent history, 20th century Mormonism did not just ignore the Waldensians as it moved to bigger and greener Catholic pastures, nor did modern day Waldensians completely relegate the Mormons to the status of a 19th century annoyance responsible for disturbing life in their peaceful valleys. Mormons and Waldensians would come to interact and to know each other, not primarily as potential converts, but as friends and partners in the defense of religious freedom and other common values. The Italian LDS Church in particular would come to benefit greatly from the support and mediation the prominent Waldensians would offer in sincere friendship and understanding. In fact, the Waldensians would play a key role in the most significant of Mormonism's recent achievements in Italy, the Intesa. The first non-Catholic religious group to have reached an intesa with the Italian government was the Union of the Methodist and Waldensian Churches. Their intesa was signed in 1984, about a decade after the merger of Italian Waldensians and Methodists into a single organization. Yet the newly acquired status was not a reason to retreat from direct involvement in religious freedom issues. To the contrary. Prominent Waldensians strongly supported the extension of this agreement to additional religious minorities. Italian Mormonism directly benefited from this support, particularly when it was finally able to overcome the impasse of its Intesa application, which had stalled in the Italian bureaucratic machinery for about a decade. 
First, Waldensian Deputy Valdo Spini, the sponsor of a 2007 proposed law on religious freedom, gave LDS church representatives the chance to make their case publicly when they were invited, alongside members of other religious minorities, to a parliamentary inquiry into the re recommended legislation. Then, a year later, the Waldensian Methodist Church supported and participated in a coalition for religious agreements which had been formed by the five religions that were seeking the Inteza, the LDS Church being one of the five. Finally, in 2011, a determining contribution came by, by the hand of another Waldensian politician, Lucho Malan, who co-sponsored with another senator the draft of the five Inteza and advocated for them as they were debated in the Italian Senate. You have a picture of Lucho there. Following the approval of three of these intese, the LDS Church being one of the three, Milan stated that the new legislation represented three important steps for religious liberty in Italy. He also added, I am especially pleased to have worked for these measures since my religious community, the Waldensians Church, was the first to attain an intese in 1984, and from that time until now, we have fought hard to guarantee the same right for others. Parenthetically, but also significantly, Milan had attended the groundbreaking ceremony of the Rome Temple in October of 2010, presided by President Monson himself. In that setting, the Waldensian senator hailed the groundbreaking as a positive day for Italy because those who profess to obey the laws of the state and the laws of God make the country in which they live a better place. It is more than likely that that experience solidified in him the desire to champion the Mormon cause before the Italian government. Now, to be sure, the significance of the Waldensian support to the achievement of the Intesa should not be singled out as, a determining, as the determining cause of its success. Here's a statement by Lucio Malan himself, uh, emphasizing that uh, if you have heard any rumors of uh, the Vatican having to give approval for the construction of the temple or not wanting to do so, all those are uh, rumors without any foundations, uh, without any base and uh, there was quite a bit of Catholic support in this process. So Catholics and individuals of different persuasions courageously backed the legislation and gave their value contribution to its success. Secondly, although friendship and interfaith cooperation brought momentum to the proposal, other factors, including the effective work of the LDS public relation team and effect, an extensive community and humanitarian service by Italian church members, were no less significant. Still, given the unique background of 19th century Mormon Waldensian interactions, it is both interesting and inspiring to recognize a line of continuity between the past and the present, however tenuous it may be, which culminated in one of the most significant achievements of the LDS Church in Italy. It certainly leads us to reflect upon the value of mutually respectful interfaith relations, on the importance of embracing religious freedom fully and well beyond self-serving motivations, and on the need to conceptualize and experience proselytization in self-giving, non-competitive terms. It also makes us wonder about the thoughts and feelings of those early missionaries like Lorenzo Snow, who took the challenge of sharing the restored gospel in the Waldensian Valleys, they probably would not have anticipated that descendants of the poor Waldensians among whom they had served would contribute to make the church a full partner of the Italian state more than 150 years later. They must be rejoicing as well.